my morbid friends. Are you happy to see my lovely face? I have not Finally. been seen in any of my videos. I am here with Amy, who is sitting in cars with books. Yes. She my does. Book blog. She has a book blog where she does reviews of blo <laughs> books. <laughs> books. Uh, so, actually, I did a video pretty recently, just a couple weeks ago, I think, about the West Plains Dance Hall explosion. Mm -hmm. And we are here at the site. Yes, so, we, we both read Daniel Woodrell's book, The Maid's Version, which was inspired by the Dance Hall explosion in West Plains. Would you like to talk a little bit about Daniel Woodrow? Sure, and I will be doing a little bit more detailed review of this, but we'll just kind of gloss over some of it uh, at first. But Woodrell is a local Ozarks author, and you might be more familiar with some of his other titles. Uh, Winter's Bone takes place in the Ozark. It was made into a film. Um, and then also the film uh, Ride with the Devil was based on one of his novels. Um, uh, what was that one Whoa. called? Whoa. Whoa. Something Whoa about Woe. to Live or something like that. I have not read that one. I'll have to look into it. But it was made into the film Ride with the Devil. I think the novel came out in 1986. This novel came out in 2013. Um, as we stated, he is a local Ozarks author. So that is kind of, he's from Springfield, which is about a little over an hour uh, from where we are hour right now. Hour and a half. Hour and a half hours. from De West Plains. Depending on what side of town you're going to. Now he did change a lot of the details. It's very obvious this is inspired. He changed the name of the dance hall. In the book it's called the Arbor Dance Hall. Uh, the blast happened in 1929 which the, the real blast was. The Bond Dance Hall happened in April of 1928 um, and changed some of the details. It's very obvious I think to you as the historian you would probably agree that some of the characters in the book, the peripheral characters, the main storyline, he kind of creates his own little fictional universe, but he does mention some peripheral characters who were killed in the fictional blast who bear some pretty striking similarities to the, the lives of some of the people who who were claimed by this, this uh, tragedy. Um, so look for my review to come out of this book, but that is the inspiration for uh, the, the Bond Dance Hall explosion, was the inspiration for this book by Daniel Woodrell. Um, let's go see where it happened. Yep. Let's go look, take a look at the site. So this is the post office. It was built in the 1940s, but somewhere in this region right here was the site of the Bond Dance Hall. And I'm going to include a picture of the dance hall before the atrocity. Over this way, this building right here was here at the time. All of the windows in the upper floor were blown out. And we encountered a super nice gentleman. Chase. Just Yeah, his name was Chase and we were just trying to see maybe somebody knew what buildings had been here. I didn't expect anybody to know anything. And my gosh, this guy knew the names of participants, years and dates of things. I was astonished. Where buildings were precisely, when they were torn down, when they were built. He was a wealth of information. Yeah, and I, I know I'm not going to remember a fourth of what he said, but he said he did work inside this building doing a renovation and the floors in the upper part are still blackened from the blast, which there would have been a couple of buildings in between there, he said but it would have been close. I'm not sure if it was the exact side of the post office or somewhere in this, I don't think this street was yeah. there at the time. Yeah, so it, I believe it would be right there, kind of central to where the street is. Yes, so just to give an, a, a little refresher, I would recommend watching my first video, but this was a just horrific event. There were about 60 people at the dance. They held it every Friday. It was organized by the Martin family. Sula Martin, do you remember the husband's name? E.G.? R.G. R.G. Martin. Martin. And they had a daughter, Dimples, who was playing the piano that night. The band had canceled, and so three locals were, they were filling in for the band that had canceled. 
and two of the three of them died in the explosion. Downstairs there was a garage and they, 80 years later we still have no idea. Nobody knows what happened and there are a lot of people who have theories but no one knows for sure. But something exploded in that garage. All of the people caught inside, the survivors reported flying into the air and then falling. So they fell down into the basement, into all of these flames. Most people had absolutely no chance whatsoever of getting out. Men were more likely to than women. Some of that was luck on where they were located. If they were near the edge toward the street, they might have been lucky enough to have been blown out of the building. One guy actually grabbed a hold of a wire and was hanging from a wire. And they caught him. They said, let go and bystanders caught him. But a lot of women just, their clothing was so flammable Men were protected more than women, and it said a lot of them had the clothing blown off of them or it had burned off of them. They were found in just tatters of clothing. So here we are behind the dance hall. You can see in this photo here, no Jones, it says NY Jones on that sign, had a building back here. And on the bottom floor were some businesses, and on the top floor were apartments. and. People in those apartments had to get off of that upper floor. They caught fire immediately. My first video tells a story about a married couple who had a brand new baby girl and they barely got out with their lives. Both parents were burned. The baby was not, thankfully. This lot was empty at the time and according to the friend we made, Mr. Chase, this is where they put the bodies. It served, served as the temporary morgue. So they just would find them in the wreckage behind us and then take them over there. Wasn't a whole lot to find for most of them. Rescue was impossible. That's what makes this so heartbreaking. Anyone who witnessed this and came and wanted, they knew the people in there, they could hear them screaming and crying and asking for help and there was literally nothing they could do except stand and listen. I cannot imagine the PTSD some of these people must have had from witnessing this. Somewhere in this vicinity would have been the Arcade Hotel. Again, a lot of people witnessed the event from the Arcade Hotel. There was one witness who was just thinking to himself right before it happened, those young people sure are having a good time. And then the world blew up. There was a guy blown out of a chair sitting in the hotel. It blew out all the windows. I mean, people heard this 30 miles away in Thayer. People heard this explosion. Just amazing. This is okay, the so this office. Is 202. This is the offices of the newspaper. I believe the vast majority of the articles I read were from the Gazette, which was housed right here. I'm gonna go across the street so you guys can see this better. 202. Here's a better view of the Gazette office, which is now a law office. Anyone know what 19 divided by Zorn divided by 12 equals? Because I don't. I'm not sure what number Zorn is. Sounds like a... It sounds like a villain in a comic book. I wonder when this was built. The year of our Lord Zorn? 1912? 1912 Zorn? This church was built in 1886. I guarantee you there was at least one funeral here. My research showed that every church in town had at least one funeral. 
This opera house is so beautiful. It was built in 1893. I wish I could go inside. It's so fabulous. It said the movie theaters had just let out right before the explosion. That's why so many people witnessed it and were unable to do anything. I wonder if they showed movies here at the Opera House, because a lot of live theaters transitioned over to movies. I just, the woodwork up there is so amazing. Here's some of the woodwork. This is the floor in front of the Opera House. Looking inside the windows, this floor continues inside. This is the front of that bank that would have been here at the time. West Plains Bank, I think was what it was I called. I believe so. According to the papers. Uh, now so West Plains Bank has moved to the building. Next right, door. this is West Plains Bank now. But then it would have been here. And it had damage. I'm guessing probably windows blown out. I bet. Most of these buildings had some windows blown out. I still, I mean, the top of that looks a little charred to me, but that could be. Which one? Of the bank. Oh. See, it's, it's blackened on the It top. does. I, this could be it, age wear and tear. Too. Yeah, it could. It's hard to know. But it would have been in pretty close proximity to. Very close. Because the, the blast would have been right there. You can see the post office. We are standing by the courthouse. And I don't even know if it's legal to show a courthouse, so I'm not gonna show a big part of it. But this courthouse is new because the blast down that street destroyed the 45 year old courthouse that was here at the time. They abandoned it, they had to rent another building which they used until one was, a courthouse was rebuilt here in 1935. I really wonder if this is burn damage. This is the building he was telling us these windows were blown out and he did work in there and the floors are blackened from burning. We are standing on the spot. So that's how far away the courthouse was. And basically it cracked the foundation so badly they just it wasn't safe to use anymore. An architect came from Springfield. His name was Hicken Lively. If you've seen my video about the funeral of John Goad, he led the procession for that funeral. And so in 28, six years after that funeral, he came here to check out the courthouse to see if it was safe to inhabit, and he determined that it was not. We found Zorn. <laughs> Here we are at this really nice memorial for the unidentified. There were 20 of them. One of them was actually identified. Mabel Riley was identified. Sadly, her husband, James Esco Riley, was not. So to keep her with her husband, Mabel was buried with the other unidentified. So there are 20 people here, 19 of whom could not be. Sadly, none of the articles I read in my research said anything about Mary Violet Adair or her experiences. I feel a real kinship with her because frankly, when I look at a picture of her, I see myself. And I mean a literal physical resemblance you look at me, you are looking at what she would have looked like at 40 years old. At the dawn of a new day, when the shadows flee away. Their community has not forgotten them. There's some really pretty flowers left for them. Amy asked me if any other victims were buried here. And the answer is yes. If they were local and they were identified, they were buried with their families. 
The same goes for people who were visiting from other places. A lot of people were home for Easter. So if their bodies were identified, they were taken home to their hometown. There are 20 of these little headstones with nothing on them for each of the victims. We just stumbled across the grave of a, another victim, Major Bob Mullins, who served in World War I. He was supposedly engaged to be married to Kitty McFarland, who was the undertaker in West Plains. Now, Kitty had a 12-year-old son named John. Kitty had recently been widowed when her husband was killed in an automobile accident. So her poor child lost both parents in just a couple of years period and was left completely alone. He was on site the very next day after the accident looking for his mother in the ruins. For some reason, he got the attention of Mr. Kellett, who was a very successful banker in town, who ended up adopting him. And later in life, John McFarlane was a very successful businessman in town, in West Plains, much as Mr. Kellett had been, who ended up raising him. But so many people in West Plains lost family just about everybody either lost somebody or knew a family who had lost somebody. It was a very intimate accident that really affected this community. Children lost parents. They lost siblings. Hey everybody, we're back from the site. <laughs> We've had slushies. I had I had a regular Blue colored raspberry. one. I had the soda kind, so yeah, I look fine. I went all sugary. We're back in Springfield now. Um, we're at the Nature Center. We're, we're uh, true to my vlogging adventure. We are sitting in cars with books. So now we're going to kind of talk about, talk about the, book. the book a little bit. I have a theory as to why he changed so many of the details. And that theory is that because he does kind of come to a final conclusion about, he chooses one of the main theories. Now let's take, take a little bit of, of time. We haven't really talked much about the theories. Mm -hmm as to what caused the Bond dance hall explosion. But Woodrell does kind of choose his favorite among those theories uh, to put into the book. I will not tell you which one of those, those that is because um, I don't do spoilers in my book reviews. Um, but one of the theories was that uh, the man who owned the garage, was it Wiser? Wiser. Wiser who owned the garage uh, underneath the dance hall he had some odd facets to his personality. He was a former minister who had retired from the ministry and he started the, is that, is that right? He Am was a Pentecostal right? minister from, is it O'Fallon? Something like that. It was one of the, well, basically from St. Louis. And apparently he was against dancing, talked about the evils of dancing. I don't know if he was actually threatening anybody, but apparently he didn't like that. He was having money issues there were stories that he blew up the dance hall to get the insurance money I don't know how I feel about this he was found 20 feet outside the back door with the doorknob still in his hand so he was either trying to leave or come back in just getting there and so that depends on was he found on his back or was he found face down I have no idea I don't know mm. if he set off an explosion and was trying to get out before it went off maybe it didn't work or or <laughs> if he knew there was a fire and was trying to get out it, it was just an accidental it fire could have been an accident and he didn't make it i don't really feel like there was i feel like it was an accident myself mm -hmm. if he had d deliberately said it something went wrong and also what horrible person would deliberately set a fire for insurance money when you knew there were 60 people in the building up above you that's i don't care if you felt like what they were doing was immoral that's just unconscionable to me so i yeah. don't i don't know that i buy into that necessarily as well now there was a character that i, I believe in this book maybe was supposed to be kind of a meld of him there was a preacher 
who in the book stands outside the dance hall and, and screams things at them. They're all going to hell. And um, I had made threatening statements. Made threatening statements. Yeah, which was sort of sort of a red herring for the novel. You know, what one of those things to, kind of to lead you here are all these possibilities of how this could have started, who could have done it. Um, so another theory, another real theory, which I found quite interesting, was a natural kind of a, a chemistry-based theory that there were possibly gases that mixed together natural gases underneath the ground that just caused a natural explosion. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You know, there are a lot of sinkholes either. around here. I, who knows? There's mm-hmm. a, a lot of caves, too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That seems kind of far-fetched to me. I think uh, that seems far-fetched. Uh, and a little scary to you just be walking around and then the ground explodes. I don't I don't think I buy yeah. that. Um, another theory was the jilted lover theory that there could have been somebody there that uh, his former sweetheart was there dancing with another man and in a crime of passion he, he created this created a fire which got a little out of control. Um, hopefully didn't mean to blow the entire building up, but if that is the case, then what a jerk. And I don't really like this one either. I feel like it it was it had to have been just some kind of accident with the gasoline and the mm-hmm. vehicles in there. I what it could have been, I don't know. No one knows. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if this happened today with all the experts and the fire marshals we have, they probably could figure it out. Yeah, figure it out really quickly. quickly, but not then. Mhm. So Long story short, Woodrell does kind of take one of those theories and uses it, you know, puts it into his book. Um, He he kind of plays off several of them. Um, And and like I said, you know, he places some red herrings in there and kind of leads you you off in different directions and then you come back to a certain place. Um, As far as Woodrell's book in general, one thing I will say for him, this man can write. He is a very skilled writer. His uh, prose is effortless it flows beautiful. it's very beautiful prose at times you know i i have heard other other reviews that i've read on goodreads a lot of people find that a bit distracting that it distracts from the story there's you've probably heard the term thrown around uh, if you follow some other booktubers purple prose that it's prose that's so ornate so flowery that it distracts from the story and you kind of get lost in it you lose track of characters some people feel that way about at times I think that happened for me um especially when it came to characters especially when they had the same last name maybe and they were related like they sort of flowed together and it was hard to keep track of who and some of the relationships were fairly similar um the book is very short. It's just over novella length. It just classifies as a novel, in my opinion. So it's extremely short. It's a quick read. Sometimes you do find yourself going back and reading some passages just to make sure you understood exactly what you were reading. One of my favorite things about the book is he does insert some extra little passages. One of the main things he wants to do with this book is paint a portrait of the area, of the Ozarks, of West Plains. And, you know, people who are familiar with West Plains can recognize it, even though he gives it a different name. He calls it West Table. But it's it's a portrait of this beautiful country that we live in, in, in uh, southwest Missouri. And he picks people from the real historical record, and he kind of blends their stories together. Um, you may have talked about some of them earlier in the video, but like the piano player, Sula, Sula, Sula Martin Dimples, uh, or Dimple Martin was playing the piano that night. The band had canceled. We did talk about this a little bit earlier. And so locals were filling in. Alice Holstein was playing the saxophone and, uh, Mullins, Carl Mullins was playing the drums and, the organizers of the dance were Sula's parents, Dimple Martin's parents. He had a character named Dimple in the book. She was going to the dance for the very first time in her life. In real life, uh, Fisher, Ruth, Ruth Fisher, was went to the dance for the first time in her life. So he took these real people. He kind of switched their names around. He switched their stories around. He did have another character who was playing the piano that night things like that he also had a couple who were engaged Engaged. to be married and you just get two or three pages that talk about a victim you don't know much more about them other than just their basic Mm -hmm. 
circumstances. I think he was just trying to give a view of who lived there, what kind of people were killed in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he based, I, I could tell, having done so much research on it, I could tell who he was inspired yeah. by. Yeah. Sort of in homage to the real event and the real people who lost their lives. And so he places these these tiny chapters, short little vignettes about each person in amongst the the more salacious story that he's created. It is quite salacious. Um, I will never think of the word squirting the same way again after some of the the (laughs) scenes in this book. Um, So beautiful prose. Uh, He paints beautiful pictures of character. My favorite thing about this was the way that he introduced the character. Uh, The story is told uh, from the perspective of Alec, a young man who's gone to spend some time with his grandmother, who has often not really been present. She's been in and out of care homes and things like that. She's kind of losing her memories. She's falling into dementia a little bit. Um, But she's telling him her history. She's going into a lot of the stories that have shaped her as a human being. And her sister was one of the individuals. This is a very fictional character, Ruby. Um, was not a real victim of this explosion. And I don't think she was inspired by anybody. She was not. Hopefully not because there's some details about Ruby that that wouldn't wouldn't be very, you know, good to have out into the world if if it was your real family member. Um, But she's she's explaining the things that happened in her history, including losing her sister in the explosion uh, of the dance hall. And one of the most beautiful for both of us, we talked about the scenes in it, Um, was when they had the funeral for the members of the dance hall explosion. And so many of the bodies, and this happened in real life, they could not be identified. They didn't know what went with each individual. They had no idea who these people were, except for the fact that they were missing. They knew that they were there. So the people in the coffins are just anonymous human bodies. And at the funeral, Alma is going through, and because she doesn't know which coffin her sister's remains are in, she goes through and she kisses each one, one by one. It's little character details like that that I feel like are the strength of this book, and beautiful details that paint a really pretty picture of what happened in this book. Um, and after, well, after her sister dies, she she's a maid so she's supposed to keep her hair short so it doesn't get in the food when she cooks and after her sister dies she is so grief stricken she forgets to go get her hair cut and finally she just decides I'm never going to cut my hair ever again Mm -hmm. just as a homage to her sister that from that point after her sister died she's never going to touch it ever again and as an old woman when Alec meets her then it's She's, she's Rapunzel, basically. I don't know how you couldn't at least have to trim it. I don't know. Oh, that would get really ratty, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a neat image. But overall, I feel like I, you know... He could have almost made it longer. Sometimes I felt like the, the little snippets we get of the townsfolk are, are a bit short. Um, I agree with that. I felt like he only did three or four. Mm-hmm. And... There was a and lot they, that was left out. And these people out. never come up again. And so I feel right. like he, he could have done it for at least, mm-hmm. well, maybe everybody. I mean, there were 40 people who, yeah. in the book, there were actually 42 victims of the explosion. Uh, in reality, it was a couple fewer than it that. It was 40. 40. 40 overall. Uh, but basically, that was my take on it, is that there was so much beauty in this book he could have almost put a little bit more into it and it would have still as short as the book was it would have still caught our interest and it would have added to the story a lot um but overall i i recommended this i think i'm gonna give it a four i really liked this book now there were there were parts he does he likes really really long sentences i'm talking really long and um he uses really big words. I don't necessarily think it was purple prose. I think he just used a big words and that he liked really long sentences. 
Here's a great example of his, his writing. This is how it starts. The congregated silhouettes of ruin attracted steady visitors who arrived most evenings around sunset to stand and behold in the everyday wonder of sinking light just what contortions tragedy had wrought and left in view. That's a gorgeous way to talk about mm -hmm. the ruins of a tragedy that's just happened. I mean, An another I thing I liked, he described the sound of a train as going nowhere, going nowhere, going nowhere. Mm -hmm. I liked that too. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So anyway, I think that concludes probably. Is there anything else we want to go on and talk about? But I hope you guys have enjoyed our talk and mm -hmm. our adventure today. We did find out Zorn is a person. <laughs> and we, we, we saw his uh, tombstone. You'll see that when we go by it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Zorn was the, the man who owned the Gazette. Yes. And so he had that building built in 1912. But it did have divisions, or yeah, division signs. <laughs> 19 division sign, Zorn division sign 12. That's a really, Zorn. That is a really weird way to put that, in my opinion. <laughs> So there you go, Mr. Zorn. W.J. Zorn, was that what it was? I think so. Okay, W.J. Zorn. But I will probably say Year of Our Lord Zorn forever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and see you next time. We'll see you next time. <laughs>